Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining on uh, a Friday to check out this latest development opportunity from Huts. Like all of our development opportunities, you can find these on our website at huts.com. Head to developments, go to see all. And these are organized by pricing. And here in the six to $900,000 range, we have today's feature development opportunity, which is Barber Road. So before diving into Barber Road, I want to give a little bit of a background of what development opportunities are for us. There are a lot of steps that go into a raw land development and getting a house from a starting point of a raw piece of land, from acquiring the right piece of land, making sure that it can facilitate the ambitions of your property, improving that piece of land, designing a house, permitting that house, onboarding a contractor, financing the project and going through a successful build sequence. And so going through those steps and that conveyor belt of key milestones is in a lot of ways the reason huts exist, but our development opportunities are a location where we've done a lot of that thinking up front. We've thought through how do all of those pieces come together in one project where we've kind of thought about the end state. And for a lot of folks, this is a bit of a shortcut into working with us that this exact development opportunity looks great or something very similar to this sounds right. If it's not exactly here, or not exactly the standard place on this lot, that the components are there for the type of project that they have in mind. And so this project fits into a category that is a relatively typical use case for us. The idea of a second home for somebody that maybe lives full-time in New York or New York metro area, a property that can be equity positive from the moment it's built, and a property that can be cash flow positive from the moment it's built. And what this satisfies for the right person is an ability to rent it sometimes, to have it pay for itself through its rental and be able to use it sometimes as well. So making it a very flexible asset rather than a very expensive second home that's kind of pure expense or a kind of pure investment property that they're never able to utilize. This is a property type that we think fits in this middle area that we hear a lot where it's, I'm not exactly looking to be a full-time property developer or investor. I'm not exactly in a position to carry a second home on my own without any offset of the, of the expenses. And this development opportunity in Barber Drive fits into that category. So Barber Drive is a forested lot near Calicoon, New York, and this is along the Delaware River in the Western Catskills, right on the Pennsylvania border. Neighboring towns nearby would be uh, Narrowsburg, not too far from Livingston Manor, not too far from Roscoe. It's also a region that we do a lot of work, and we're often very excited about both the this interesting mix between the cost of land acquisition, so large lots that are really beautiful, really diverse topography and natural conditions, but really accessible prices per acre, quite development friendly legislation and, and jurisdictions in the area, and cost of construction that seems to be uh, pretty accessible. And so we really like this region as a place to pursue huts development opportunities. So like I said, we'd be here in Calicoon, we're in the western side of Sullivan County, the lot itself has some really great features. It's a mature forest. It has rock walls and granite rock outcroppings. With a little bit of clearing, you get ridgeline views from the parcel. So you get some of these expansive views. So it really feels like you're sort of in the forest, but also high enough altitude to get some of those kind of forever miles long views. The property itself has sort of south facing that the slope kind of runs up against the the south, so it gets really excellent light. And so you can imagine in the winter, you're going to get low light coming into it. In the summer, you're going to get this sort of sun dappled uh, forest floor with all of the kind of south facing light coming through the, the tree canopies. So the first step in a project like this would be to acquire the lot. A lot of our clients work with our, our buyers agent consultants to go through the exercise of acquiring the lot. And if this project seems compelling to you, we can make that referral and, and you can work through the acquisition of this parcel. And so here you can see it feels like the, the, the parcel in the aerial view is isolated from the road, which it is, which is really nice. You can kind of remove yourself from road noise, your setback. But you can see there's a little outlet road that makes it so there's really no traffic coming by. You're out of earshot of the, the main road and you're sort of at the end of a shared right of way. So this lot is listed for $89,000. We would recommend going through some amount of due diligence before closing on the lot. We 
generally recommend ensuring that the the land use is going to be appropriate before closing on the lot. We always recommend getting a, a perk test completed and a survey compete, completed to make sure that you really we, we know exactly what the boundary lines of the parcel are and that we can ensure that a standard septic system can be built on the parcel so we're not fighting against development of the parcel on you know, for, for months trying to come up with an exotic sept, septic or infrastructure approach. Okay, so now at this point, you've acquired the parcel. And the next steps are to, in the, the kind of world of land development, are to go from this raw lot that you purchased to get to an approved lot, a, a lot that has approvals for a septic design, to get to an improved lot where it has the key groundwork conditions to, to allow you to build a house that's usually going to be well septic, a driveway, and power. And in going through the investment in that land, you are changing the the determination of that parcel in the eyes of those who would appraise the lot. So banks in particular, and changing the valuation per acre of, of that lot. And so that's a big kind of goal for us is to deliver equity into the project well before the house is built, that you go from this raw land that you purchased to an approved and improved parcel that you're starting to recognize some stored value in the land that you've purchased. And so here, what we're showing is that we would extend a driveway following the slope of the the topography up to the top knoll of the parcel, giving you kind of wide views in each direction. Have a little kind of turnaround driveway, clear as small of an area as we can to be able to accommodate both the the house location and septic field, and build a little bit of a trail system that circumnavigates around the top of this uh, this hilltop. And you can see how that the relationship to the sun there that the steeper arc is the the sun in the summer, the lower arc is the sun in the winter, but in all cases, the house is pointed towards the south facing light. It's going to get really fantastic daylight uh, throughout the year. So we'd go through that groundwork preparation and like the small diagram <laughs> demonstrates, as we are doing more of that work, the appraised value of the lot is changing and you no longer have that raw lot. You have more of a turnkey shovel ready parcel and that comes with a change in valuation on uh, on the lot. And so you see that here that probably spend around $30,000 on your driveway, assuming almost a 400 foot run of driveway, around $5,000 on tree clearing and some some site prep, around $6,000 on running your electrical, about $12,000 on a well, about $25,000 on a septic. And I think it's also important looking at this, these numbers that it feels like a major expense into the into the project, but it comes with every development on a raw parcel. And so, you know, we advise a lot of our clients, both in development opportunities and on our more standard service projects on land acquisition and what land to choose, because the acquisition cost is really just the starting point. The question really you need to be asking yourself on land development is what is my acquisition plus improvement costs going to be in total? And sometimes the more expensive lot has more people pieces in place and all told it's going to be less to get to that development ready state or that build ready state. So just a reminder and point of education when evaluating parcels. And so in this case, we purchased the lot for 89, we've gone through due diligence. We've Hutz has worked on managing that groundwork and site planning, uh, providing the site plan and kind of documentation materials to execute on each of these pieces. Uh, you're about $100,000 in on groundwork site planning and and hard cost improvements, and you have about $194,000 into the lot at this point. But you've also done this more important piece, which is now the lot is a totally different thing. It's no longer that, like I said, that $90,000 lot that you purchased. Its cost per acre has changed dramatically. And we would assume that we've delivered around $45,000 of equity, stored equity into the lot. Okay, now to get to the next pieces, which is designing the home and construction of the home. In this case, we chose our medium bar standard as the starting point for the project for a number of reasons. One, the efficiency of the layout. 
that you have you're building relatively a relatively small footprint but getting a lot of potential occupancy and a lot of use. So that really helps with the relationship between your capital expenditures to build the house and your potential rentability because you have six to eight real sleeping areas in, in this house. Um, but it's also a really fantastic size where it doesn't feel like too much house if you're just there with a couple. And so I always like these unit types or these layouts where it makes sense for two full families or uh, four couples to go and be able to stay comfortably or for just a single couple to go on their own and not feel like they're over overspending for the place that they're staying or kind of knocking around in an, in an empty house. And so the medium bar we find to be a really excellent choice for high ROI uh, rental properties. The other thing that you see here in the site plan is along that trail system that we would think about having an outdoor amenity like a wood fire fired hot tub that placing a wood fired hot tub sort of along the trail one of the things that i think is really exceptional in defining the experience of a eight or nine acre parcel is giving yourself and anyone renting the place or anyone that visits this property a reason to explore what really makes that location special are the eight or nine acres that you've purchased. And how do you kind of amenitize a little bit of the forest or create this sort of beacon to go towards and a reason to walk that trail system. And in this case, this is our way to kind of draw people along the, along the trail. And so on the construction side, you'd have the medium bar, which we kind of think about in this area of your cost per square foot is going to be around $400 on the construction side, assuming mid-tier, mid-tier to high-tier finishes. And generally how that cost break breaks down is in three categories. You have shell costs, which basically assume you're looking around your house, or your apartment now, and, and remove all of the flooring, remove all the tile, remove all the cabinetry, but keep the mechanicals in place, keep the plumbing in place. And that's kind of your shell. And the shell costs we build for around $250 a square foot generally in this region. You're going to have glazing and roofing costs, which is a variable that you're able to control. What is the level of specification on your windows and, and doors? And what is the roofing type, whether it's standing seam metal roof, which tends to be at the kind of highest level, or is it a asphalt shingle, which can be really beautiful, but it's going to be come with a lower cost. And then the place where you have the most amount of controls in the fixtures and finishes. So your cabinetry specifications, your flooring specifications, lighting, tile, bathroom fixtures, other plumbing fixtures. And when we work with our clients, we have a series of options within kind of each style and each vibe, but ways to go up market or down market and help to dial in some of those costs. But starting from, in this example, looking at this part of the project finishes and fixtures representing around 20% of their overall construction costs. You have structural engineering fees for the permit documentation baked into this, this hot tub as an expense. And here is also in the design, permitting, interior selections, construction documentation, and uh, coordination with the contractors where the kind of second half of the HUD's design and development fee is, is happening. So now you've purchased the lot, you've improved the parcel, we've built the house, and all told at this point, you have the nine acres kind of fully fully improved new build house with three bedrooms modified with two baths at build costs and between acquisition, hard costs and soft costs of around $780,000 with a market value on the backside of around 900. And so you produced a pretty significant equity day one around $110,000 as a projection. If we kind of play that out on the right side around what your potential revenue is, and you say, well, I'm only going to open it up for a maximum of 16 nights a month, because I want to use it the rest of the time, we're kind of projecting an annualized figure of around 500 $525 per night or $8,400 a month. A lot of people ask us where our figures come from for the rental side. There's a number of locations. AirDNA is a decent resource. I think one of the problems with AirDNA is it takes the average rather than the median of the best stuff. And so you have a lot of miserable properties on Airbnb that skew pricing down. So we also look a lot at really excellent direct booking locations, newer construction and more desirable properties that have kind of succeed in set them, setting the market. And this is these estimates are in line with those sorts of higher quality properties. And so looking at around a 50% occupancy to produce $100,000 a year, which at a construction 
loan amount here that would be in the let's assume you're doing kind of 20 percent would be around six hundred and fifty thousand dollar construction loan which today at around seven percent you're kind of handily covering your costs and some so gotten you to um, both an equity positive project and a cash flow positive project which for this particular use case which like i said in the beginning is a sort of common use case for us that's the goal along with just creating a remarkable beautiful place and, um, and i think hopefully it kind of comes across in these development opportunities that we are equally committed to awesome placemaking phenomenal design but also thoughtful economics and making sure that the asset that we're defining makes sense and so that would be the completed property a a beautiful forested plus or minus nine acre lot in a highly desirable area of the western catskills hidden from the road with a hilltop view in each direction with great southern light and a very thoughtful forested escape so let me stop here one thing i do want to mention is at the bottom of all of our development opportunities there's th two things to check out faqs questions that i get asked a lot on these webinars but also over email and and from most most clients please feel free to read through these they have kind of guidance on rental figures, financing approaches, levels of design modifications we can go through, et cetera. And at the very bottom, you have a form that if this development opportunity is compelling to you or one like it, or something that kind of follows some of this format, but you want to kind of tailor it to your location or your desires a little bit, please fill out this, uh, this form at the bottom of this development opportunity to get in touch. And we'd love to talk through what you have in mind. All right, let me stop there. And I'll kind of come up to here and open it up to Q&A. Just throw your question in there and Ali and I will try to answer as much as we can. Uh, Anonymous asks, will you include your financing assumptions in the chart? I think that that's something we can start doing. The One of the reasons we we don't is we, we don't want to assume how folks are going to finance their projects. Sometimes people use a combination of cash plus a variable rate loan like a HELOC from their existing property. Sometimes people get a traditional construction loan that will flip into a 30-year fixed mortgage. Sometimes people cash finance and then choose to take out a cash out refinance later. So there's lots of ways that people go about this, but I do think that that's a good idea that we can look at in the future. Is what what do we anticipate the carrying costs being in a typical 20% down using the loan as collateral financing condition where 80% is coming from a construction loan and making sure that our, our rental figures are surpassing, or you can compare the rental figures against your carrying costs. Uh, Chris asks, how do you structure your contracts cost plus? No, our our build partners often get to fix price and we like if we can. And so more and more, we are able to get into fixed cost pricing because there's less variability in the commodities market, less variability in the materials pricing. Things are staying a lot more stable. And so the, 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 the cost of subcontractors and a material vendors, uh, general contractors are able to stick to for a longer period of time, which really just wasn't the case two plus years ago when, if anyone out there remembers, cost of lumber was going nuts and concrete was all over the place and then paint was really expensive because of anything that had plastics in it was nuts and and a lot of that has stabilized where the contractor doesn't have to kind of protect themselves so much through a cost plus contract and yeah. also just quickly maybe to touch on the last question about financing one of the things we think about a lot is really how do you use sort of the acquisition of the land plus potentially kind of groundwork to force equity into the property such that your construction loan can use the lot as collateral. So I think really that sort of first moment after groundwork is really important. That value created right there is very important because you're going to basically need to get to 20% down on your construction loan no matter what. So if you can use sort of money that you're going to use anyway, put it into put it into the lot through groundwork improvements, then then you'll be able to a, have a more valuable piece of lot, a, a more valuable lot anyway. But we can also tend to sort of we find the value curve highest at the point of groundwork. So, I mean, you're de-risking the lot quite a lot when you get get it perked, when you sort of get sort of everything turnkey ready for, yeah. for the house that de-risks a lot for the bank. So so you can generally 
get away with spending less than it will be valued at for that point. Yeah, it's a good point. The, the, this project costs 800 grand and you bought the lot for 80, the bank is absolutely going to want $160,000 as 20% down. So you can either collateralize the land plus give an $80,000 check, or you can take the land, put 40 into it and create some equity and, and then utilize this more valuable piece of land that you've created. Yeah, I think that's sort of a, a goal in all of these projects is to boost the value of the land and not not be cutting just a cash check to the bank to for your deposit on your construction loan. Really becoming a land developer, right? And that's sort of playing these these games and, and really thinking about this as an asset that you're getting equity out of the entire way through, which, you know, is is just if not more important than the design at the end of the day. Sure. Chris asks, how do you source the contractors and subs? So uh, we spend an enormous amount of time building up our, our Rolodex of, of builders and evaluating, vetting, soliciting pricing well before we have any projects uh, that we're thinking about working with them on visiting projects, assessing skill sets, looking at what their team looks like. And it just so happens that in this part of the world of Western cat skills, we've been doing that for years, we kind of know everybody and we have real opinions and who we like to work with, who makes sense to work with. and. Uh, who have been consistently excellent builders of our projects. And so this is very different than what you might have from a design firm or an architect that designs something and then says, all right, great, let's go find the builder. And then they, you know, it's not too much different from looking people up in the yellow pages and mm -hmm. listening to bids. And for us, we've worked through a lot of our, our pricing and construction methods with builders up front. And so that makes these numbers defensible. And we also have our kind of database knowing who's available when for what scale of projects and, and also our kind of rankings and ratings on who do we like working with and why. Matthew asks, what is the scope of work during the construction phase in relationship to the GC? So once you get into construction, we flip into an owner's rep role and we're there for really three three main categories of, of benefit. And one of the biggest ones is that to help the client and contractor speak the same language because they, they generally don't. That what the contractor's looking for is often different from what the homeowner is looking for. And what the homeowner wants to hear is often not translated that well from the contractor. So that's sort of a big one. But we're also there for design quality control, making sure that what we've designed for and what's been permitted and what's been documented is what's actually happening. I mean, we do that by fielding uh, the ongoing questions from the build team, which there will be some, and being on site at all key moments of construction. And that usually means siting, excavation, foundations, framing, MEP rough in, drywall and close up, and then some of the finishing work. We're also there to help defend some of the budget and time frame that the way that construction loans are, uh, or construction projects are financed, is through construction loans that are based on milestones. And when, for instance, the framing is reasonably complete or the contractor says it's reasonably complete, they will submit a, a request to be paid for that work and the homeowner approves it. And so the homeowner might say, yeah, I think it's done, but I don't really know what I'm looking at here. And a big part of our role is sort of making sure that what is being paid for is what's actually been done to the level of satisfaction of both our team and our and our client. And so it's, it's a collaborative relationship, but we're also there defending the interests of our clients. Let's see, Ricardo asks, during the due diligence when buying the lot, are you able to determine if the property plan could be built or not? In other words, what happens if you acquire the lot, then during construction, you fail to get the permits or realize for whatever reason that the house can't be built? Yeah, I mean, that is the purpose of the due diligence period. So single family residential, if it's a single structure, tends to be quite easy to determine. The things we would want up front are a soils report, a survey, and a perk test that ensures that a standard septic or some, some septic design can be accomplished. And if that is the case, then we'll get your building permits. The more complicated circumstances are when you're see seeking to develop the lot called more ambitiously, where maybe there's a subdivision goal or there's multiple structures you want to get in place and or a change of use that you're now going to have a main house, but also 
a commercial part to it, like a workshop. And you're also going to have a couple of rental units on the property. And those become more in-depth evaluations of the ability of the lot. And more than that, the the region or the, the jurisdiction to facilitate and grant permission for that type of use. And, you know, we go through that sort of evaluation all the time. But on the single family residential side, the thing, the single structure residential, the things you'd be looking out for are septic design, potential wetlands, making sure that there's no existing liens on the property. And that's kind of, those are sort of the big considerations. Chris asked, are there model homes that one can visit? We don't really build model homes, but um, we do in this area have properties that are both under construction that we can schedule visits to check out and completed properties that we can kind of send folks to drive by and see from the street. We don't really send people in the finished homes, but, but like to bring uh, potential clients by similar scale projects that we're working on nearby. And this happens to be an area where we have a bunch of them. Anonymous asks, have you done any projects in the lower Hudson Valley in Westchester County? Yes, in a project down towards South Salem and are working on one now that's near Chappaqua. It hasn't been a major destination for us, largely because we kind of started out with a lot of these second homes, but we have more kind of primary home projects popping up. And Westchester County, particularly the northern part of the county, has a lot of the same challenges that all these other regions do, along with exceedingly expensive construction pricing, which a lot of our approach helps to helps to combat, like how to bring accessibility into a place that's quite aspirational. So Anonymous would happy to be would be happy to chat about your project. Uh, Matthew asks, what are the rough square footage costs on a slab versus crawl space versus full basement? This is well, it's a tough one to answer. You kind of think about it as not just concrete, but what's the excavation required to get there. And so it's a little bit dependent on what the land condition is. And so if it's really sloped or really rocky or whatever it might be, then that's uh, that sort of dictates some of this. But just on the kind of raw material side, the full basement tends to have 50% more material than a crawl space, which tends to have 50% more material than a slab. And so that's one way to think about how to compare these. But it's, I think clients and prospective clients tend to think that this is a bigger driver of cost than it may seem. We often find that window specifications and roofing type has more impact on overall cost than the foundation type we choose to specify. Chris Brown says, generally speaking, how long does it take to build a home once you've broken ground? We, again, very, very dependent on when we're starting. Is it the dead of winter or is it sort of through the main part of the building season? But we usually reference six to nine months and that tends to hold up. Cool. Great questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. If I'll give it one more minute going once, going twice, if you have any other questions, okay, going three times. Thank you so much for joining. Like all of our webinars on development opportunities, this will be, this has been recorded and will be edited and placed onto our uh, Hutt's YouTube channel for you to revisit and check out for as long as this parcel and this opportunity is live and, and not pending or sold. But if this development opportunity seems like a cool one, please do get in touch or something like this makes sense for your goals. Let's absolutely talk through your vision and I'm excited to to hear from you soon.